Well, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity today to present to you. My name is Amol Karnik. I'm CEO of KA Imaging. I'm here with Kareem, Kareem, CTO of KA Imaging. We have a new innovation on the X-ray detector. It allows us to get a higher resolution, lower dose, and leverage LCD manufacturing, the same screens that you see on your computers, smartphones. We can leverage that manufacturing to create lower cost X-ray detectors with higher performance. We can also sell into medical and non-medical applications. So our earlier revenue will be coming from non-medical applications. So a little bit about us. We're based out of Waterloo right now, and the technology is from the University of Waterloo. We have four people working on it, the two of us plus a couple of Kareem's former students. We have been working on this for about two years, but the technology has been incubated over the last 10 years through the university in various stages. We actually have a functioning one-inch prototype that's de-risked the way that the technology and actually built it at the University of Waterloo to the in the foundry at the university. So what is x-ray? I think everyone's quite familiar. Most of you have probably had an x-ray at one point. But it is about an $11 billion business in the U.S. alone. 300 million procedures are done using x-ray in the U.S. alone. And about 2 billion procedures done globally for x-ray. It is the sort of de facto standard where a lot of other modalities get compared against when you're trying to bring out new technology. In radiology, there's one sub-segment called interventional radiology or interventional cardiology. That's where they actually use x-ray to guide their procedures. So if you've seen someone get a, a stent put in or heard of someone getting a stent put in, they use a real-time x-ray. And the people who are actually concerned about radiation are the people in their OR, and the radiologists, interventional radiologists or cardiologists doing these procedures. So they get actually concerned about the amount of radiation they get beyond just the patient because they're using this technology to guide their procedures day in and day out. So they're getting more radiation on a daily basis than the patients will. What you see in front of you here is, uh, is a lady holding an x-ray detector or an x-ray imager. This is the device that actually captures the x-rays. There's the x-ray source, there's the x-ray table. The patient would lie right there, okay? This x-ray camera slides right in underneath or it could slide in on the side if you're standing up for your x-ray. That's basically what x-ray imaging is. This device has replaced x-ray film. So if you're familiar with x-ray film, you knew they had to be large. They had to be large because you can't focus x-rays, so it has to be as large as the object that's being imaged. If you're trying to image a human, then it's got to be as big as, for example, the chest, the leg, whatever it is you're looking for, right? So x-rays finally went digital in the year 2000. Just like film cameras transitioned into digital cameras, um, x-rays went from film to digital. This started around the year 2000. Now, ah, thank you. Now, what's been a bit slower going to digital is video, okay? So video x-ray is still done using analog systems or analog uh, tubes, which are very similar to your cathode ray tubes in the old television sets. That's what you see here. That's why you see the image is a circle, okay? Now, video x-ray, the image is not so clear, but what you can see is, I mean, you're trying to see what's going on inside the patient in real time. The problem with, these, with this type of video x-ray is that um, the dose has to be very low you're, because you're trying to see inside the patient continuously, okay? The dose has to be low not just to irradiate the patient too much but also sometimes in interventional procedures, for example, when you're trying to insert a catheter inside a patient, um, the doctor's hands are going to be in the path of the x-ray beam. So you want to make sure that the doctor doesn't get irradiated, otherwise there's some limit on the number of procedures that can be done. The other challenge with these type of systems is you can see it's A, it's a circular field of view, B, the field of view is not very large, C, on the edges you get distortion which can cause all sorts of interesting problems, okay? Now, digital x-ray, if you could do video x-ray with it, would be very useful, okay? Because it has a large field of view, it doesn't have distortion on the edges. The only problem with digital x-ray today is that the x-ray dose to the patient and to the doctor is still a little too high. So hospitals have not switched away from real-time x-ray, okay? They haven't switched away from the analog tubes. The analog tubes are still the dominant device that's out there. Now what you see here is another image. It's a little clock that's moving around. Turns out real-time x-ray is not just useful for imaging patients. They also use it in the uh, industrial imaging field, for example, in food inspection, in, um, in, um, in things like baggage inspection, in things like um, 
looking at in automotives, in the automotive industry, looking at little bearings, looking for micro cracks. So real-time x-ray has markets beyond just medical. That's what, uh, like that's essentially what the point here is. Now here's what we've got. Existing technology uses a scintillator to take the x-ray and convert it into light, okay? Once you get light, that light is sensed by a light sensor that is on the same plane as the transistor, okay? The transistor is what's used to take the signal from the light sensor and transfer it for um, image processing in the software. The challenge here, of course, is that the transistor layer is, in terms of size, similar to that of the light sensor. So all the light generated by the scintillator doesn't end up in the light sensor. Some of it just ends up here and it's wasted, okay? If light is wasted, that means x-rays are wasted, which means now I need to crank up my x-rays in order to get the same image quality. Okay? That's one of the major problems with existing technology. What we've got is we use a lateral light sensor and we stick it right on top of the transistor layer. This allows us to get a 100% or a 95% fill factor. This allows us to capture more light and we automatically get an improvement in the dose. Okay? There are other benefits to this technology as well. We can eliminate crosstalk. We improve reliability. It's built in the exact same process as your LCD screen. Many of you have laptops. If you look at the screen and you know what technology is used in that screen, that's exactly what our technology is. We can go to an existing facility in Asia and tell them, look, here's our design implemented. And indeed, we have done that, and we've gotten that type of feedback. So if I had to summarize what we had here, we've got a x-ray detector that can be realized with a very low capital cost, okay, um, because it uses LCD TV technology, it gives you much better signal to noise ratio, so you get low dose. It can give you much higher resolution, so that's just better visualization. And one additional advantage that we haven't really talked about, but what we do have, is that we can actually stack two of these detectors on top of each other, and we can realize something known as multispectral x-ray. Multispectral x-ray, the, the analog to that would be um, would be color, for example, in cameras, right? You have black and white and you have color. With color, you get much better visualization. What we've got here is we've got a method to bring color to x-rays. And we can do that very effectively, very simply. Um, and just imagine, every x-ray machine that's in use today in the medical, non-destructive field is just imaging black and white. And now we will be able to add color to this. Okay, so it has really wide application. So just to summarize some of our value proposition, why are we, why are we doing this and why there's a value here and what we're doing. So when you look at the doctor's benefit, they'll get a lower dose. So when we're talking about lower dose, we've quantified it about 20-25% lower dose than existing technology. From the hospital's perspective, you can give a lower dose that the physician can actually do more, more procedures. And if we give them a new imaging modality or the color, they can actually diagnose more. So from a patient's pers perspective, we're getting a higher resolution we're getting more image to see, and you get a better diagnosis. So what's our overall market? If you look at x-ray imaging systems as a whole, it's about an $8 billion market. The subcomponent of what we're doing, because we're going to be selling x-ray detectors, is about a $2 billion market. And just to give you another, that's on the medical side. And the non-medical side, and non-destructive testing, it's about $450 million, and about $200 million in the detector side of that. So we've got various markets, obviously various sizes that we can go after as well. And that sort of opens up to where our competition comes in. We have com competitors that are some of the big multinationals. So we have got ma four major competitors. That's the GE, Samsung, Varian, Perkin Elmer, and Trixel. Those are the major ones right now. There are other ones coming out of Asia as well. But from what we understand and what we've seen, their quality is not as good. We where we really differentiate ourselves is our low infrastructure costs. The big guys have all invested about $100 million to create these specialized manufacturing equipment. So that's a very key part here. They've made a fairly large investment that need, they need to amortize all their over the units that they need to sell. Our startup costs are much less because we leverage the LCD manufacturing. We don't have to amortize, amortize $100 million over multiple detectors. We also have the ability of patents. We've got nine file patents. Six have already been awarded. We've got two more than the pipeline that we want to put in. We do also have the multispectral. So that's really a blocking patent. When we talk about adding the color to x-ray imaging, that so for the digital side is actually a fairly blocking patent for us. So no one else will be able to actually copy this aspect of what we're doing. 
So when we look at competitive positioning, how do we compete, or where do we actually differ compared to the rest of the companies out there? And if you look at, there's the standard, when we say vertical light sensor, that's what's on the market today. There's new, newer technology using a CMOS detector, which is another type of technology. But when you look briefly across the board, they each have trade-offs. We overcome those trade-offs by offering the lower cost, higher resolution, lower dose, and easier manufacturing without specialized equipment. This is where really we stand out when it comes to the competition. So just a little background about myself. I do have my master's in electrical engineering, and I always say I'm an electrical engineer by training because there's no way you'd want me to design anything that would save your life. <laughs> I've let, let go of my engineering past a while ago. I've been at GE Healthcare, I spent seven, eight years there. The last four years of my GE days were in the mergers and acquisitions. So we acquired four different companies, acquired, integrated them into GE. We had a slightly different view of mergers and acquisitions within our subcomponent. We owned it, we did the deal and the integration. So we had to pitch that out a year later to the CEO of healthcare at the time. I was at another startup in Vancouver afterwards called Ultrasonics. Where it's about the 20th person in, we grew the company from about 20 people, 100 people, with no revenue to $30 million in three years. And I've been at other startups, one was local here, Sentinel, and I've been founded my own company at one point in biotech, and been an executive in residence with some of the incubators that I believe you'll be hearing about later in the evening as well. And so how are we gonna make money? How are we gonna go to market? So we're initially gonna se start selling by mid to so about third, fourth quarter 2016 in the non-destructive testing and veterinary markets. So these are two markets that don't actually need regulatory. So for anyone familiar with medical, you have to get regulatory approval. So while we're in the middle of getting regulatory approval for the much bigger market, which is medical, we have a smaller market, which is a $400 million market to go after. So that's talking to, there's about 25 main people who sell x-ray detectors for non-destructive testing or veterinaries. So we're starting to reach out to them to start getting some earlier sales. We will then start selling in 2017 in the medical imaging field. So we're gonna get our FDA approval. The reason we wanna get our own FDA approval or Health Canada approvals is that when you talk about retrofit, so there's a film and something called CR, computer radiology, that can actually have a direct retrofit. So if we have already an FDA approval or a regulatory approval, we can actually retrofit and go to the retrofit market as well. And, but our main channel of sales will be selling to the x-ray system so that they integrate what we have into their full system. And there are advantages we've went through before. It's going to be the resolution, the cost, and the dose reduction that give us competitive advantages over other x-ray manufacturers, x-ray detector manufacturers. After which what we want to do is introduce the multispectral or the color imaging as well. And that's in 2018. So we have a nice timeline and pipeline to, to bring products to market as well. So just as a very high level financial, as I mentioned, we'll start selling in 2016. By 2019, we'll be about 50 million. But that's really based on about 1,200 units sold. What's interesting to note, we'll, we need about 125 panels, 130 panels roughly, to be break even. And if you look at the market, including, say, a computer radiology and a di direct x-rays, it's about 30,000 units by 2019. So we've got a, we're going after a very small market share, so we're not going by the top down. We've been building this from bottom up, how many we expect to sell and how many units we expect to sell. But from a market penetration perspective, it's going to be fairly low by even 2019. So we've actually started talking with multiple different OEMs. So like the GEs, Philips, Siemens, multiple tier twos as well. We're actually are very fortunate. We have one of them coming. We've entered NDAs with quite a few of them, some not listed up there as well. We actually have one x-ray manufacturer coming to visit us next week. because They're very interested in our technology and really want to move forward and they want to move quickly. We spoke to them two weeks ago and they're making the effort to come see the technology at Kareem's lab and see, really characterize and make us some offers. And so just as maybe a high level, just for maybe those who are not as familiar with medical imaging or medical devices, there's normally two major areas that people look at. And I always like to add a third one. There's always the regulatory, which is going through your approval, such as 510K, Health Canada approval, CMDD in the in European market. And because we're a sort of replacement technology, there's a very well understood and well defined process for us to get our approvals. 
It doesn't require something called a PMA, which is a pre-market authorization and much longer clinical trials in the US. It requires something called a 510K. And, a much, and as I said, we need to verify, validate, and we normally take three to six months to get those approvals. The other area that people always get concerned about is reimbursement. So if you have a new product in the market, getting it reimbursed is always a challenge. But again, because we're a standard x-ray device that we're replacing another device, there's already reimbursements that exist. So we don't have to try and get new reimbursement codes for what we do. There's reimbursements that exist. And the other area that I always have to make sure is that even if you have those two check boxes done, is there a clinical need? Do actually people care that you do have new technology? And you know, this is, they do for us. We've actually been talking to radiologists, talking to interventional radiologists. Dose is an issue. One of my friends at GE, he's the dose manager for GE Europe right now. And he said, you know, they're, they're, these interventional radiologists are getting very concerned about this because they've had, last conference he said, one of the keynotes or one of the people who was very well known in the interventional radiologist died of cancer. So it just brought up the awareness that yes, we're in a radiation field, we need to be a little more careful, and hence even you know, the big guys are starting to put people in these fields to help you know, guide the radiologists, interventional radiologists. And also the color imaging, when we talk about color imaging, this dual energy or multispectral energy is really going to be able to, if you take chest imaging, for example, right now they're starting, Mayo Clinic is switching to dual energy by using another method where they have to do more radiation, whereas with us we can just do one single exposure. And it really shows that there is a need for this dual energy because you'll be able to see cancer stuff. Essentially dual energy gives you, as Karim maybe mentioned earlier, you get a high dose and a, low, a high energy and a low energy. One sees the bone structures, one sees the soft structures. And you can actually subtract one from another to see more. And so we've got some great papers that show that you can see nodules and stuff that are hidden behind the rib cage before by doing this dual energy. So there's a clinical need. So what we're looking for is about a half million dollars right now that we want to leverage up to two million dollars. How are we going to leverage that? We've been talking to Ontario Centers of Excellence. They actually helped fund the first little prototype that we have. We've been talking to SimTech. So we've got a letter of support from SimTech that's willing to do 200,000 as a convertible note. We do have, we've been speaking to Investment Accelerator Fund, which is through Mars as well. And we actually have been fortunate. Kareem is a Grand Challenges Canada winner. So he won the Rising Stars Phase 1, which allows us to now apply for a $1 million match. So if we raise a million, they'll come in with another million. Plus, we, as Kareem mentioned earlier, we actually now have an LCD manufacturer who's going to create the first full-size 17 by 17 inch for us out of Asia. And for us to have done that would have cost us three hundred to $500,000. They're doing this as in-kind. So we've got an opportunity to really get a full size. We need to create the matching circuits to that. So we're keeping some of the IP in a way on our side. They're going to make part of it, and we're going to do the rest of it. And so we're going to use the money to create that first, first, first full size commercial prototype, secure some more IP. So we do have IP that we want to file, more IP that we want to file. Plus, we have got some of those customers that we've been engaging with, allows us to really move forward with them and try and secure our first purchase orders as well. So we expect, you know, most medical imaging devices, most medically probably seen, five to seven years is where you start really getting traction and the exit opportunities. Some of the, uh, it's probably a little small, I realize, but you can always share this screen with anybody who's interested. But just to give you an idea, pre-revenue companies over the last five, 10 years have been acquired for about $100 million roughly. Post-revenue companies have been about 287 million in acquisitions uh, on average. And that's taking the top one, the highest ones out and the lowest ones out as well. So in summary, we have really a fast market. We expect to be start selling by next year, by the third quarter, fourth quarter next year. We're going earlier through non-destructive testing while we're going through our regulatory approvals for medical. And there have been great exits in the, even in this area. Sentinel Medical was acquired for 150 million roughly. There's been Visual Sonics acquired. There's been many companies in the medical device company, even in our local infrastructure that have been acquired and done very well for the shareholders and investors. So we look forward to having further discussions and open to questions now. Thank you for your time today. <laughs>